All right, how's everybody doing? Welcome to Tuesday. Yes, it's Tuesday. I'm Mike Jeffers, Chicago Jazz Magazine, chicagojazz.com. And of course, you are watching and listening to Chicago Music Revealed. Hopefully everybody is doing well. Hopefully everybody is staying safe, staying healthy, staying socially distant, and wearing masks wherever you go. Thus the way of the world. Uh, of course, I'm also, I always have to say this at the beginning, because we're getting closer to September. I'm also the Director of Programming and Entertainment at the Epiphany Center for the Arts, opening up in September. September 1, we're going to be doing live music six, night, six nights a week with a very COVID-safe guideline protocol. More to come on all of that. We will be announcing the schedules and announcing the live music schedule here in the next couple of weeks. So stay tuned. Plus, we're going to put a live streaming element onto the whole thing as well. Of course, all the information at epiphanyshy.com. Now, this is an exciting show. This is going to be fun. I've got Jerry Roach on, and he is from Dot Time Records, and we're going to be talking about two releases, one never re before released, and another reissue, and it's coming out on vinyl, and they're both very interesting. But Jerry, how are you? I'm glad you could take a few minutes. Thanks, Mike, for having me. I'm doing well. Thank you. Well, I'll tell you what. I'm going to let you set this up, but the why don't we talk a little bit about this um, Wolfgang Lockerschmidt? I probably said it wrong. And Chet no, Baker. no, you're there, you're right on. Oh, yeah. good. All right, and Chet Baker, and it's a new release now. But let's talk a little bit about you before we bring that up, and then of course we're also going to be talking about the Louis Armstrong Live in France release. But before we get to that, you're with Dot Time Records, and you are the director of Dot Time Legends as well as on the A&R side, too. But for our purposes today, we're talking about the Dot Time Legends. Reading up a little bit, 2015, it got launched. And basically, what's the premise behind the behind the Legends series? Well, uh, Joe Bickhart, the owner of the label, uh, had been uh, issuing or or being my distributor. I have a, I had a small label, Mighty Quinn, which I'm reinvigorating. But it was mostly reissue of older jazz that I grew up listening to that my mom really kind of turned me on to. So stuff like Pepper Adams and Edmund Hall and great music like that. And so he had been distributing my music and I was working with Mosaic at the time. And then as things happened, Mosaic kind of slowly moved away from the warehouse although they're still active and still great. Mm -hmm. um, and then I had the opportunity to talk to Joe, and he wanted to to kind of investigate some archival stuff and through connections that I've had through the years and just finding different things, digging different things up. We've had great luck. We've had, you know, Ella Fitzgerald live from 1968, uh, Ben Webster from 64, uh, Buck Clayton and Joe Bushkin from 1952. Wow. Oh, so, man. yes. And then we were, um, we negotiated a deal with the Louis Armstrong Educational Found uh, Foundation, and we've had a series of four releases. And, uh, the last one was a live in Europe CD, and then we kind of split off uh, two LPs from that live in Germany, which was released last October, and then this live in France. Well, you know, it's it's it, it. First of all, it's amazing, and I'm so glad that Dot Time Records is doing something like this, and that you're able to spearhead this because. You know, you know more about this than me, but as a music student, when I was coming up, I used to have to go to the listening lab at North Texas and I'd sit there for hours and everything. And we didn't have YouTube necessarily back then. You know, it was like you had to go sit in a lab and learn about this stuff. But, you know, it seems to me like all of these recordings would be just kind of not forgotten about, but not at top of mind. But as you release these, you're actually bringing this music back. You're bringing jazz history back to the forefront, right? We're trying, and uh, luckily for me, with uh, the Louis Armstrong, I have a great partner in crime with Ricky Riccardi, who's head of the collection at uh, Queens College. And his knowledge of Armstrong is unsurpassed, as far as I know. And, and you know, I get to listen to hundreds of hours of Armstrong, and we pick different cuts and 
and we're able to kind of distill it down. But Ricky really has the knowledge, and then we just kind of put something together that we think is not only of historical value, but really puts Armstrong's legacy in the spotlight once again. So people never forget how great an artist he was. That's one of the the most important things. And I think that, you know, you guys are, you know, doing such a great service with this. And I mean, even, you know, back when you were with Mosaic, they used to put out a lot of, a lot of back, you know, re-releases and things like that. But for you guys to be doing this and pushing forward into the 21st century, doing this kind of stuff, I mean, Louis Armstrong, you know, obviously people know Louis Armstrong and know of his playing and know some of the hits. And, you know, as the musicians get older and as the younger musicians come up, I'm not sure how up to speed they are on some things, but you're able to re-release this thing. So Louis Armstrong live in France. Talk a little bit about this recording and the timeline of this, because, I mean, there's a lot of musicians, younger musicians, especially that listen to this, that probably are not familiar with this recording or even knew some of the history about Louis Armstrong, but he was huge in Europe, wasn't he? He sure was. And he had been to the UK and toured in uh, Europe Till about 1935 and then he left the continent and this is his first performance back um, after World War II. It's 1948 and it's in Nice and it's really the first at the Opera de Nice and it's the first real jazz festival ever. Oh, and, wow. Right, so this yeah. is just, it's it's amazing stuff and it's it's over two nights in February and from the CD, we had um, eight songs. And then for the LP, we added two others, uh, Dear Old Southland and Royal Garden Blues to the vinyl. And that's almost nine other minutes of music. And the it's really the band. It's the first time Earl Hines was playing with him in mm. years mm -hmm. since, you know, the late 20s when he was his musical director. Yep. And you have Jack Teagarden, who's probably one of Armstrong's favorite cohorts. And then mm -hmm. Barney Bagard on this record for me, the clarinetist, is he's just so amazing. I mean, he, his, his solo, which is his feature on Rose Room, is just phenomenal. But his playing in the ensemble for the next song, Panama, and then Sunny Side of the Street, He's just really kind of the secret weapon. And then there's Arvel Shaw, who spent a lot of time with uh, Armstrong as his bassist. And then Sid Catlett, who unfortunately died very young. I think he was 41 or 42. But his drumming is fantastic. Yeah, yeah. So while Sid, when he was playing, what a... <laughs> What a, what a player what a, as a drummer. I mean, I've, I've studied Sid Catlett. I mean, man, you know, and, and so what I'm, I'm always curious about these uh, recordings from back then. Were you surprised at the quality or did you guys have to do a lot of, uh, a lot of mixing and master? Well, you couldn't mix probably, but a lot of mastering and, and adjusting to try to get, get the quality up. Well, the quality was amazingly good. I mean, you know, this is a relative thing for 1948, yeah, right. But thankfully, I have um, my good my good friend um, Lou Jimenez, who does all the engineering, and he's absolutely amazing, and he really does a fantastic job. And we've worked together from my first project um, on Dot Time all through the rest of the projects, and we work really well together and. He really restored this to almost fantastic measures because everything except for maybe Mahogany Hall Stomp sounds spectacular, but the Mahogany Hall Stomp was so good that I had to leave it in even though it has a little, a little uh, surface noise here and there. Mm -hmm. But with that, I would rather give something – to the public as they could hear it and without rolling off either bass or trumpet and just letting them hear it because I'm certainly no one person to be 
taking off the top of Louis Armstrong's yeah, trumpet. Right. right. Well, and, and, you know, that's the thing, though. I mean, I think if you're listening to a recording from 1948, um, and by the way, in France, and by the way, shortly after World War II, last time I checked, I mean, you know, so if there, there's going to be a little bit of surface noise and there's going to be a little bit of, of, of sound quality issues as opposed to what you would get now, but the fact that you can actually hear this, I mean, and it's a moment in time, and your story about how this is the first time they're back and the players that are on this recording – um, I mean, what were you surprised about? Was there anything that surprised you on this recording that you're like, you know, this is amazing. I had never th- heard this before out of Louis Armstrong or the band. Well, this is a, a Ricky again, and I are, are kind of a, trying to champion this thought, which is that people were saying that in 1948 and all through the fifties that Armstrong was playing the same songs every night. He was doing the same solos. And that's simply not true. I mean, Mm -hmm. the the version of Panama here, I mean, he's just on fire. And and then you have something which, you know, now resonates more and more. His poignant singing on Black and Blue is just, uh, it's very touching and it's beautiful. It's just, it's... It's a joyous sound, and and you hear a band like Dear Old Southland, which I added as a cut to the vinyl, is basically just almost, there's a little Sid Catlett playing some accents behind them, but it's basically just Heinz playing piano and Armstrong, and it's absolutely amazing. Wow. (laughs) Wow. All right, so this is on Dot Time Records, DotTimeRecords.com. We're going to send everybody over there, and I've got the link up underneath. But there's also another recording that is being released, and it just was released, I should say. And uh, Wolfgang Lackerschmid and Chet Baker, uh, Ballads for Two. And this is a release that's on vinyl. It's been released, and this is a re-release, and it's coming out on vinyl now, right? From 1978, I think? 79 yes 79 79 so talk a little bit about this because this is the one i told you before we came on the show that i listened to and i was you know i i was not familiar with wolfgang's playing and i was really listening to a couple of the tracks i was i was blown away about the by the way it wasn't what i thought it would be when it's vibes and trumpet right and it was a different thing and it sounds there's a lot of interaction happening what's the story behind this recording well i from talking to wolfgang who i met at jazz ahead a couple of years ago and he's and still then alive he, too that's why i should yes, tell everybody he's and still alive he's still an amazing player and and i would i would direct people to go to wolfgang's site as well he is a phenomenal player and he said that he had a a group of songs and releases that he had done in 79, 80 and 86 with Chet Baker. So of course I was curious. And then when I listened to ballads for two with just Chet on trumpet and Wolfgang on uh, vibes, it was just so intimate and such a beautiful recording that I I couldn't, I, I couldn't say no. And I had to go after Wolfgang to uh, to make sure that we could put it out. And it's mostly Wolfgang um, compositions, but he does do Blue Bossa and uh, Softly as a Morning mm-hmm. Sunrise. I, I, and, of course, uh, he had Chet. The first thing that they did to just kind of warm up was something that Chet knew really well, which is You Don't Know What Love Is. And then it worked out so well that they kept it for the record. Oh, wow. (laughs) Yeah. And then they ended up playing a lot together. But uh, Wolfgang, I guess, and Chet were in different bands at a festival. And Wolfgang told Chet about his idea for trumpet and vibes. And Chet was like, I'll do it. (laughs) He was pretty I guess he agreeable a, to a lot yeah. of that stuff, wasn't he back then? Yeah, and then I guess he got you know, he got a call from Chet's manager, and they put it together. Wow, <laughs> how was the recording quality on all of this? I mean, it, it's probably it sounds great to me. So, I mean, did, did you have to do too much to it? 
really the only thing we had to do was kind of take the surface noise, the 1979 surface noise off of it. Again, big props to Lou Jimenez for that. But it it, it was it, it's really just the two men, and and it's almost telepathic at times. That's what it sounds like to me. The the way the interaction is happening on this recording from the couple of tracks I heard, it's it's um it's haunting if you want to say it that way. You know, if you're Oh, absolutely. It. Yeah, I it's really and and it's back out on vinyl. So, you know, what what do you what what are you hearing when you hear the vinyl? I mean, it's got to sound a lot warmer than obviously the digital release or when it was up, you know, if it went out as a CD, but I mean, it, was there something on on the vinyl that you decided to put this out on vinyl because it just needed to be heard that way because that's the original way it was heard? Absolutely, because uh, there was two songs that really had me thinking vinyl from the beginning. One was Waltz for Susan, which is mm -hmm. my favorite track. And that was on the original release. And then there was uh, a second take of Why Shouldn't You Cry? And the first take is is Chet playing with his trumpet. But the the alternate take that we added was why shouldn't you cry has a muted trumpet and it to me it was just so achingly beautiful that it screamed out vinyl to me yeah but those two tracks really made me want to put this out on vinyl man well i you know it's it's for everybody watching and listening to this the couple of tracks i heard off of this i was just i was blown away it was not what i thought i was going to hear because i've heard i've listened to a lot of chet baker this just sounds like something unique that if you're a chet baker fan or if you're just a fan of music or jazz i mean this is something that you should pick up so it's on dot time records dot com just came out on vinyl and uh and then of course louis armstrong live in france is on dot time records dot com and now just looking over the website it looks like you have uh releases lined up we were talking a little bit off air uh, about some of the releases that you have coming up in the fall too i mean is this something that regularly you you're putting out now and and people can kind of keep checking back to see what's coming up next yeah we're starting to have a little bit more of a concentration on vinyl mm -hmm. because it's making a comeback and cd sales are not anywhere near the way they should be but uh we just released uh, uh lenny tristano duo sessions and then we'll be putting a vinyl component out in the fall and then hopefully another Wolfgang Lagerschmidt and Chet Baker with Larry Coriel uh, that they put out in 1980 and uh, that's I'll got be Tony Williams on, on it right isn't that what you were talking right. about oh man <laughs> yeah it's it's pretty it's pretty cool stuff wow man you know, it's it's amazing to me. Talk a little bit about Dot Time Records and um, the thought process, because when I was reading it, it looks like the Dot Time. I mean, I've heard of Dot Time. Obviously, we've gotten releases from Dot Time and everything, but I never really looked into the back end of it. But it's it looks to me like it, like it launched in 2012. But one of the lines on their website says uh, Dot Time Records is successful if their artists are successful. And I really love that. That must be the mission behind the entire process for everything you guys do, right? It sure is. Yeah. I mean, we've we've enjoyed a lot of success with Catherine Russell, who is just one of the greatest singers of our time. And to be able to have an artist of that stature be on our label and to be able to work with her is just – it's it's it just keeps me speechless <laughs> it's really it really is amazing and then we have younger artists like nicole zoritis who has a new release in a couple of weeks we have uh brett riley who's going to be on mighty quinn mm -hmm. who's more of an americana artist and not jazz so we're we're kind of expanding but keeping true to supporting our artists and getting out there with radio support and we have lots of people in the press who are who have started to really kind of come behind us and seem anxious to hear what we're going to do so it's it's really the past couple of years have been very exciting to work with this label well you know talk a little bit too because you know lydia liebman who i know we're both fr good friends with um 
she uh you know she's pushing out and she's still pushing out artists and promoting stuff and we've talked to a lot of different pr people over here on this show this is episode 72 i started it during the pandemic uh, to connect everybody in the music scene together and i'm getting you know inquiries from individual musicians and then also labels and then also pr people people are still even during this time people are still pushing out music and creating new music um, what are you guys finding as a label during this time? I mean, you obviously have a captive audience because people are somewhat sequestered. They're not going out to clubs, unfortunately, to see live music. So they're looking for fresh new releases or re-releases. I mean, what are you guys seeing as a label and how is this? Have you had to adjust anything because of the, the, the COVID situation? We we have. Um Releases that we we would have done all through the spring have been kind of pushed back. Stuff that was going to come out in the fall or November uh, have kind of been pushed to the beginning of next year, and and we've kind of put a a moratorium on signing new people just because we want to do justice to the people who have been waiting. Hmm. for their you know when somebody works eight or ten or 12 months to to only be told you know it's not the right time to yeah. to release something it's it's devastating yeah. so um we're trying to just maintain the artists that we have and let them get the spotlight that they deserve even if it's been pushed off for three or five or six months mm-hmm well, I think I think and also, I mean, maybe you can talk to this. I'm finding that uh, because of the situation, a lot of artists that are always running from gig to gig or doing different things like that have had an opportunity now to come in and learn some of the technology and learn about different ways to connect with audiences digitally and stay relevant. And if they're putting out a new release, they're at least able to connect in different ways. Is, are, are some of your artists, is that like something that, is top of mind for some of your artists when they're, you're putting stuff out? Are you saying, okay, now let's let's set something up virtually or digitally so that you can connect with people even though you can't go tour, we can still get the word out? Yes, very much so. Um, again, Nicole Zoraitis is just uh, somebody who has kind of grabbed this opportunity and she puts on a show every Friday. I think it's from 4 to 6. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, the streaming has become uh, just a way of keeping your core audience, and and I think that's that's valuable. And we have a, a pianist on our label who's in Switzerland, Claude Diallo, who's been doing a lot of that as well. And it's just it's important for the artist to stay with the audience, just as it uh, conversely, it's it's important for the audience to stay with the artist because. Mm -hmm. You know, it's through no fault of their own that they're not touring, and they really want to be out there. I mean, I get calls all the time from our artists just trying to find out what the terrain is like to be able to get back out there. Yeah, this is one of those times, and, uh, you know, I, I've talked to a lot of artists, a lot of management people on, on the show, and this is one of those times that, I mean, even during the financial crash, 2008, um, there was business still, there was festivals, there was something happening. Even if, you know, some of the sponsorship dollars were down, there was still a festival happening. There was still something happening, this kind of a thing. It's so unknown and, and nothing's happening for good reason, obviously, because, you know, you can't hold a massive event, but I mean, it's really one of those things that, um, it's going to be interesting to see what happens when we come out of this i have a feeling one of the silver linings uh, and to your point is that a lot of this streaming stuff and a lot of the uh, di different digital outreach that these artists are doing now is going to pay off in the long run when they can actually get back out on the stage i think they're going to find that their audiences if they've been engaging and been really diligent about doing this stuff and figuring out because everybody's figuring this stuff out right now um they're going to find that at least that was one silver lining. They get out there. They might have expanded their audience and connected with more people just because they had to out of necessity. I think so. I think they'll be pleasantly surprised that they've been able to kind of broaden their base yeah. because it's, it's easy to drop in on somebody who's doing a show on Facebook and say, Oh wow, I haven't had to pay any money, but this is somebody that, intrigues me or i'd like the way they covered this song or 
this original is really fantastic. Maybe I should dig deeper. And I, I, I think people are kind of getting a little bit of a preview that they wouldn't necessarily get. Mm -hmm. No, I, I agree. I mean, it, you know, you got to look on the silver lining on something. <laughs> so, I mean, what else are you going to do? Right. But right. All right. Well, J hey, Jerry, thanks so much for jumping on today. And uh, congratulations on these releases. And as more come out, let's stay connected so that we can we can preview some more as they come out, because I'm fascinated by this stuff. You guys are keeping jazz history alive and uh, keeping it at the forefront. And then, of course, all of the new artists. And we'll have to talk about that offline because I'd love to interview some of the, your artists that are on Dot Time Records and bring them on the show and maybe even be able to bring them to Chicago sometime. So we'll, we'll connect offline, and then hopefully we'll be back online talking about some other fun stuff. Well, Mike, I really appreciate your time, and thanks for focusing on Dot Time because we're really trying to, uh, you know, between the archival and the new stuff, just trying to keep the jazz momentum going. Well, I, I appreciate you doing that. And I know there's a lot of fans and a lot of listeners and a lot of viewers appreciating it too. So congratulations. It was great connecting with you. And uh, I'll talk to you offline about everything. And I look forward to having you back on the show at some point soon. All right. Thank you very much. All right. Thanks, Jerry. Take care. Bye. Jerry Roach. I'll tell you, the Chet Baker, I have not heard the Louis Armstrong. So I know that that's going to be something that I'm going to really dig and i'll have to delve into but uh, the chet baker it was haunting what i was listening to i cannot wait to go sit down and take a listen to the entire thing and um just consume it it, it was it's really amazing so everything available at dot time records dot com and uh i encourage everyone to go check that out keep jazz alive keep supporting live music no matter what genre it is and as I always say, tomorrow we've got a great show. We got Ivy Ford on the show tomorrow. That's going to be a lot of fun. And then we're going to have uh, Harar is going to be on. We're going to do some reviews on Thursday along with Greg Dusek. He is coming on. And then on Friday, Kenny BDI Smith is going to be on for the Chicago Blues and Beyond show. So you are not going to want to miss that along with Dave Katzman. We're going to be interviewing him. So, of course, I want to make sure that everybody sticks around, checks out, and I started the I started the theme song too early, but now I started it because I'm ready to rock and roll and we're going to get out of here. So I really appreciate everybody watching. Of course, share it. Like it. Do everything you can to get the word out about this show. Always appreciated. And as I always say, if you like what you're here, please tell your neighbors, tell your family, call the grandkids. Chicago Music Revealed right here every night, 6 p.m. Central Standard Time. Until next time, until tomorrow, I'll see you then.